another Magnolia webinar. I'm Zach Grant, and today I have with me Mikhail Gelich. We are going to be talking today about Magnolia Light Development, and we're going to do a live demo of what light development looks like in practice. Grant, I do technical evangelism at Magnolia, and in my darkest past, I was a programmer, but I have only done one piece of production code in the last decade, and it wasn't a particularly big project. I'm going to be doing the demo today so you can see what it looks like when a very rusty PHP developer tries to dig into Magnolia's late development. I'll talk more about that in my experience later on. And I'm joined by Mika. And Mipa, Mika, maybe you could talk about yourself a bit. Mm, I'm a, well, a software engineer at Magnolia. I've been uh, heavily responsible for the platform development, especially during, during the development of Magnolia 5.4. So um, I know pretty well about the new configuration by far and some key topics that we're going to see there. Uh, the main reason I'm here is well, I'm going to give some high-level overview about light development. Otherwise, I will uh, uh, silently listen during the demo or shed some additional highlights. And I will uh, happily answer your questions as we go through. Mika should also be my security blanket in case I make a horrible mistake, as sometimes happens during live demos. Before I dive in, let's talk about who we've built this webinar for. The primary audience is um, a typical front-end developer, and I've modeled that on myself. Hopefully, their skills are more up-to-date than mine. But by front-end dev, we mean someone who's got JavaScript, and, and some other scripting language, so PHP or Ruby or what have you. Magnolia developers, Mika's going to talk a bit about uh, light development and how it relates to the development model that our existing Magnolia developers are familiar with. probably most to do uh, in contrast to what it was before. So it, well, it captures um, a few concepts and uh, hopefully should um, become more standard development in the future. Uh, but essentially a few concepts here. Um, one, first one is the concept of light modules. So uh, before Magnite 5.4, you would uh, need Maven modules or uh, um, well, more advanced Java knowledge to set up your project. Uh, well, light modules bring an, al an alternative to that that is uh, probably more suited to front-end development as well. Uh, second key part of it is configuration by file. So in this one actually is um, an alternative to the configuration in the admin central in the UI. So you have to um, do many clicks uh, through the UI creating nodes of configuration. There you can actually have uh, to operate just on files. And the third topic um, that also goes in the direction of the light development initiative is um, the, is the templating initiative, especially the uh, templating essentials, um, the SDK extraction or the modularization of templating functions to some extent. Um, I'm not going to cover these parts too too much. We'll see a um, brief usage of those templating functions in the in the in the webinar demo. Um, but I can tell um, a few words about the, the about the first two. Let's start with light modules. So, um, yeah, on the left side, you can see uh, what the typical Maven module looked like. If you've developed with Magna before, this should be very, very familiar. So, uh, in your source main resources, um, well, you would place uh, some static resources, you have a module descriptor, and so on. Well, it's was not exactly like that before, but the most important part is um, this module name name here. It's um, an arbitrary name. It's uh, the name of your module. It's it's just a directory that is going con going to contain your templates, files, and your uh, configuration files. And uh, as you can see, just this part, you can take the same part. Um, Put it in the on the file system. Let's say uh, on the web app directories, on the resources directories, and um, you're going to use exactly the same structures. You can um, easily um, well go from a light module to a more sophisticated Maven module if you need to, and so on. 
and uh, configuration by file. On the other hand, well, it's um, the main cause why we came up with configuration by file was mostly because of the hassles with JSR configuration. Well, of course, if you just configure a simple field or something, it's easy to click through. Um, but otherwise, it, uh, for bigger projects, it can uh, become really a, ha a hassle. So, um, yeah. Instead of doing those many clicks in the configuration app and exporting them through those bootstrap files and uh, <laughs> merging those bootstrap files, um, well, uh, you would have also to um, um, well to develop with those bootstrap files, keep them up to date, um, merge the changes from others, wipe the repositories from time to time. It was also painful to upgrade, and that's why we had the version handlers uh, to the rescue. So on the other hand, the benefits of configuration by file are a lean readable format, so, well, kind of tree-like actually, uh, ease of editing, so because it's just a file, then you can open it, open it up in a plain text editor, and that's what Zach will be doing. And uh, it means also, as we've seen in the light module structure, that the files, they can live right next to the template script. So you no longer have to go back and forth between the config, uh, between the admin UI, the configuration app, and your template scripts. You can actually come up with uh, all of them in one go. Um, we have file observations so, so that the changes to those definition files um, can actually be reflected instantly. And because it's file-based, it means uh, there's easier collaboration for the development teams, so it's easier to diff, you uh, have to import or export uh, configuration nodes all over again. And yeah, finally, it's more a start remark. Uh, basically also caters for greater validation capabilities. But that's a bit of a side topic. Um, that's pretty much what I could say. So let's see how Zach will put this into practice. Thanks, Mika. Thanks. All right, live demo. Let's end the presentation. And <laughs> shut down the two things I forgot to shut down. And go to our terminal. All right, and let's give a little bit of context first. So what I hope to give people, especially front-end web devs, people who aren't Java devs, from the demo is a very practical overview of light development. I want to show what, uh, what a potential workflow could look like just using a simple code editor and your shell and a browser. I want to show you how to find the information you need to do light development. I want to show you how to find errors and how to deal with them. Uh, I want to give you some tips on how to make development easier. And I'm going to use very simple HTML for the demos. Um, I don't want the HTML that we use to obscure the other work that we're doing. I'll also use simple code examples. If you understand the concepts, you can use your own skills to do much more complex things. But if you can't understand the complex because I've got a lot of junk on the page, then that's that would be a real problem. So I started trying to learn light development um, more seriously about two weeks ago, um, roughly the time that we had to do the first rehearsal for this webinar. Uh, I went to the devs uh, three times to get help. Uh, once was to get a custom bundle that was much cleaner than the standard community edition bundle than we ship. It doesn't include a demo. And I'll share a link to that when I send out the resources for the webinar on Friday. But mostly I worked by going through the docs and digging around. I wanted to understand what it would be like for someone coming into the situation fairly new. And what I found is on one hand, I really like light development. And this is speaking as a, a scripting language developer. I've built sites in PHP, Ruby, Perl, and so on. Um, but I'm missing extra documentation that gives more examples to show just how to solve common problems. If I were a Java dev, I think it would be a lot more transparent, but I'm not. So there are things that just don't make as much sense to me. But I know that we're working hard to improve those. I see Christoph in particular make enhancements most days on improving our light development docs. And I know there are also areas where we could polish the light development experience. And this is where you also come in. If you're trying this development approach, please talk to us on the forums. Um, write bug reports. Let us know what works for you and what doesn't so we can try and smooth off the sharper edges. So 
Mika's already talked about light versus full development, but I'll talk about that in a little bit more general detail for people who aren't familiar with the, the traditional Magnolia development process. So Magnolia is a Java-based system that was built by Java experts for other Java experts. The development process was robust. You could say it was perhaps enterprise, if that word isn't overused, which it is, and it's heavy. There's a large tool stack. You need a complex IDE like Eclipse. You need to use Maven. You work in complex file formats like XML, uh, and the XML that we use has a lot of metadata in it, which makes, which makes it hard to find the actual data you want to work with. When you're deploying projects, often you're shipping around jars. It is meant to be robust. It wasn't meant to be slow, but it is a bit slow at times. It's fine for experienced Java developers. It is less good for the rest of us. Uh, particularly when you're trying to learn how to develop Magnolia, you go looking for information in your, your customizations in lots of different places. It's scattered in POMs. It's in the JCR, Magnolia's data store. It's in files. It's, it's hard to discern where to look to find what. And light development, by contrast, tries to make it so that you can develop with Magnolia using simple and common tools. You don't need an IDE, you just need a text editor. And your favorite code-focused text editor will do for you, be it Sublime or Vim, Vim is my choice, or whatever it is that you like. And you end up working in uh, working with plain text files, and you work in a small group of directories. Your major tools are a running instance of Magnolia, which you view through a browser, and your console. basically from scratch. I'm not downloading um, uh, a complete copy of Magnolia. I already have a bundle. But other than that, we're starting from the beginning. very easily on your modern operating system. I'm going to start Magnolia, and then I'm going to finish the install process for it, but I'm not going to do that just yet. And the reason is I want to set a couple of configuration options that will help us in development. So let me just go into my Magnolia directory. OK. And what I want to do is I want to put Magnolia into development mode, and I want to make Magnolia look for our light development files outside of Magnolia's path. By default, Magnolia is configured to look inside its own directories for your light development files. But the, the drawback of this is if I delete my Magnolia installation, which I do at times when I screw it up horribly, then you end up taking away your light development files. And if you don't have them in revision control, which of course you should, but maybe you don't, you delete your work along with Magnolia. So we're going to put it into a separate directory. So let's configure that now. We're going to go into the Magnolia properties file. It's at the end of a long path, so instead I'm going to use Silver Searcher to find it. I'm just going to look for the property name, magnolia.dev. OK, so we can see that our Magnolia properties file is at the end of a long path. Let's open that in Vim. OK, so we've got it open. Let's start by taking our Magnolia develop property and setting it to true. This really has one key effect for us. It makes it so that our static resources and our light modules don't get aggressively cached. If this is on false, Magnolia runs faster, but it will cache your JavaScript, HTML, and CSS, at least the static versions of those files, which isn't so helpful. I'm also going to go here to my Magnolia resources directory. You can see by default this is configured to be Magnolia Home, but I don't want that. Instead, I want it to be in my user directory. So my user directory is users Z, and I'm going to say that my light projects, my light modules directory is MGNL. Any directory that I put in here is going to become a light module as far as Magnolia is concerned. I'm going to write my file out, and then I'm going to start up Magnolia. 
So let's move into our Tomcat directory. And then let's run Magnolia Control Start. And then let's follow our log to see what's going on. We have a logs directory inside of our Tomcat directory. Let's look in Catalina.out. OK, it's going to chew away there for mm, about 15 or 20 seconds on my machine and finish the install. We have, of course, docs on this. And if you go to documentation, magnoliacms.com, it's easy to find the install docs. Voila. And I'll send out, like I said, a worksheet that gives you all these links and all the info that you need to follow along with the webinar again later on, a reference. Okay, we can see that our server has started up. One reason that I made the configuration changes before starting Magnolia, or two reasons. First, I didn't want to have to duplicate my configuration between the author instance and the public instance. As most of you know, Magnolia runs by default with one master instance and one or more public instances that you use to serve content. Um, if I configure before I start, the configuration changes are put both in the author and public. And secondly, to get Magnolia to recognize um, uh, a light module, you have to restart. And I may have to restart now because I forgot to create the precise directory for my uh, module when I created the directory for all of my light development modules. You'll see what I mean in a second. So I'm going to stop my tail. I'm going to stop Magnolia. That'll take me a moment. I'm going to make my directory. So as I configured in my Magnolia properties file, I'm creating a file, a directory called MGNL. This is our light, um, light modules directory, and I'm going to put in a light module called webinar. Voila, it's just two directories, one inside the other. Now I'm going to start Magnolia again, and I'm going to watch my logs. OK, so this will run for a couple of seconds. And then I'm going to, going to go into my web browser and finish the install. And when I finish the install, all that ends up doing is it takes all of the modules that Magnolia shipped with and uh, configures them and puts them into play. You only need to do this process when you initially install Magnolia or when you have a new module to install. All right. That didn't fail, that's great. I'm going to run the web update, which installs the modules. I'm only going to do it on the author instance because it doesn't really matter for us to have a public instance at this time. All right. And our installation is going away. So this will be done in a moment. And then I'm going to check one thing, which is I'm going to make sure that our resources directory where our light modules live was actually found by Magnolia. It's an easy way for me to confirm that I didn't induce a syntax error into the uh, Magnolia properties file or have something else go wrong. So I'm starting Magnolia. Let's go back to our logs. And they're giving us lots of information on what's going on. Let's pause those for a second. And then let's use our friendly silver searcher to look for home MGNL. And let's look in logs. So we can see here that Magnolia's directory watcher service is now watching the MGNL file in my, uh, uh, sorry, MGNL directory in my home directory. Sweet. So we're up and running. Let's restart our tail because we want these logs later on. So let's take a look at this running instance of Magnolia. I'm just going to close down a few windows to keep things clean. All right. So I'm logging in as the super user, the user with all rights. I'm going to go to the Pages app where our page-based content lives. And it's going to warn me that there aren't any page templates available. This bundle that I'm working with doesn't even ship with a demo. We don't get much. We can add a page, but we can't set a template for it. Let's go through the process of adding that first page template. And let's start uh, with the very simplest thing we can do inside of a light module. I'm going to build things up step by step. And the reason that I want to do it this way, 
and let me switch to a larger font. The reason I want to do it step by step is to make sure that each attendee understands um, all of the different parts involved in light development and what they do. And I want to do it incrementally so there's only one step to go from each stage to the next. So let's start by going into our light development directory, our Magnolia resources directory, and then go into webinar. The most simple thing we can do inside of a light module is we can have Magnolia serve a static resource, CSS, JavaScript, a text file, whatever. We could make a readme file. Um, we could make a piece of HTML. Let's, let's start with HTML. It's not a use case we would use often, but it's a good demo to start with. I'm going to call it credits. And there we go. And I'm going to paste in a basic HTML5 template. And save it. So let's go into our instance and let's find that static resource. So the first thing that we end up doing is let's make our URL because we learn a couple of things here. So we've got our running instance of Magnolia at localhost. We go for Magnolia author. This is our context path. Uh, and there's a system variable inside Magnolia that we can use to fetch this. And we'll come across this again later. At least I'll talk about it a bit later. All of our static resources are going to be under resources, a special path beginning with a dot. Then we put in the name of our light module. And then we put in the file we want to access. And it worked. And we have very plain HTML, exactly as we typed in. We would only want to do something like this in a rare case. Say that we want to have a file that an editor can't move, remove, um, or even put inside of the standard website hierarchy. So maybe it's just credits, maybe it's licensing information, whatever. Typically, we put static, re or typically we use um, static resources for CSS, for JavaScript, for things that are probably not editable by editors and that we don't usually need to dynamically edit ourselves. So that, let me just advance my notes a tiny bit. That on its own isn't so useful. We could have just uploaded a file to a web server and had roughly the same result. So let's move on to the next useful thing. Let's make it so that when an editor goes into the Pages app and tries to add a page, they have a page template to select from. So a page template is the top level of templating in Magnolia. Uh, logically, it contains areas, and areas contain components. Areas are a simple way to group components together, and we use them to control what components an editor can use. And I'll show examples as we go so you get a clearer idea of how this works if you're not familiar with it already. From the editor's perspective, the page template ends up controlling the overall layout of the page that they're creating, and it controls what components. And these components can be things like an image component, so they can select an image from the digital asset manager built into Magnolia and display it on a page or a rich text component to let them type in styled text, or whatever. And from our perspective, though, as developers, they do something else that's very important. They also define a data structure for pages in the JCR. And I'm going to add a page now if I can. OK. So I can't do it yet, but I will show you what it looks like as soon as I can. A page template consists of three major parts. You have uh, some configuration in a YAML file called a page definition. You have a free marker template that actually renders the page. And you have a dialog definition, which builds a form that would look something like this. Let's show how these go together. And let's start with the page definition. So I'm going to close this instance of Vim. I'm going to go back to my terminal. I'm going to open up Vim in um, project mode. OK. So let's start by creating our uh, the, the basic directory framework for our page template. So we want to make a directory called 
templates. Helps if we can spell it right. Pages. And ah, sorry. Uh, let's go up. Helps if you use the dash p option. Okay. So now we should have a directory called templates, and inside that directory we should have a directory called pages. So let's create our basic um, page definition uh, inside of here. So this is a YAML file. As Mika mentioned, YAML is a simple uh, text format. Uh, one thing to note as we put it in, and I'll explain this after I put the code in. So let's make our file. Uh, let's call it basics. That's what we're going to call our page template .yaml. And then let's put in a little bit of code. Okay. So there really isn't much that goes into our um, uh, page definition. Um, we give it a title. We tell it what script to use to render the page. And then there's a bit of information that's almost always the same. The rendering type, we say we're going to use FreeMarker to render the, um, uh, the page, and that it's visible. And we can turn this to false if we don't want it to show up. So the title is what gets shown in the Pages app. So let's say title is basic template, or even just basic. It'll always be in a context where you can see what it means. Process anything in here as being either a, a page definition or a page template. By convention, we put it inside a pages directory. We'll also have components, and we may have many pages and components, so we want to keep them separate so that they're easy to distinguish when we're editing. And finally, we want to give it a title. The title is not necessarily important in its own, on itself, but for clarity, let's call the page template with the same file name as we set for the title. Let's save it. And let's go back to Magnolia to see what happens. I'm going to add a page. And suddenly, I have a page template available to use. I call my page test. I'm going to save it. And we're going to get an error. Well, not yet. We're going to get an error as soon as I do this. OK. So while I can create the page, as soon as I try to actually do anything with it, sorry, one moment, I'm just having a bit of trouble with GoToWebinar. There we go. As soon as I try to do something with it, it complains. And the error we get is handy and quite straightforward to read. It's a little messed up because the font is so big. But what we get is a clear message. File not found exception, template, and then lo and behold, the path that we set to our uh, frame marker template to render the page isn't found. Now, we get this information in two locations. If we're working in the uh, author instance, then errors get shown in the Magnolia environment. If we're not, if by some horrible chance we are working on a public instance, those errors would only go to the log. But there's a problem here. This includes a full stack dump, which makes it difficult to read. So let's take a very quick detour and fix that. Because somewhere at the top of this, we have, well, actually, this isn't so bad. We get our message here. But in other error messages, it's really hard to find what's gone wrong, especially if you're working in a huge font for a webinar. So let's filter our output from tail a tiny bit. So tail.f, same file as before. Let's pipe the output into grep. And we want to do two things. We want to tell grep to um, actually buffer the lines. 
If not, sometimes tail ends up sending incomplete lines to grep, and then grep doesn't have a complete line to try and match patterns against. So line buffered. One note, other note here, I'm using the fish shell, and it has really nice completion for command line arguments, which makes this all much easier if you're doing it on the fly. All right, the other thing I want to say is invert the pattern that we're looking for. I want to get rid of all of this. So that I can see is a tab and at, and that indicates where the issue happened. So I'm going to look for this pattern. At the start of a line, look for a tab, and then look for either at or a sequence of three dots. And we know that there's always a space after that. Oops, and there, let me set that alternation properly. Okay, let's see what that gives us. Ha, voila. Now we don't have the verbose reporting on uh, what's going on with the, um, uh, the stack dump. So the last thing we want to do is these errors get run together when you get a lot of them. So I like to add in a little bit of space. So let's use our friend said to just take all the lines that begin with a date, because that is how we know that... Um, uh, it's the start of an error line, and then let's stick a new line in front of them. And it's a little ugly because I'm using um, OS 10. If I was using uh, sed on a Linux system, it would be cleaner. But I need to put in an escape character, add a new line, use ampersand to include that 2015 that I matched earlier, do it globally, and now, now what we'll have when I create an error again, let's reload this, Oh. oh, it's still a little bit long, but that's okay. Now we'll have a bit more space in front of our error messages. Mm, I think I messed something up. But because we're short on time, I'm not going to try to fix it right now. You can see the idea. The logs are your friends, but use tail and use grep to trim them down to what you need. You can also go through them with a typical text editor, but it's easier if you can just follow the logs. Okay, so now let's set about fixing that error. So we know what we need to do next, in part because we have an error message telling us we need to go in and create the template. So let's go back to Vim and let's create our template file. And we can start simply by taking the credits file that we created before and using it as the base for our free marker template. Free marker lets you easily mix your free marker tags and so on right into HTML or vice versa, depending how you look at it. So let's make that file. So we're going to put that in templates because it is a template. We're going to put it in pages because it's a page. Um, it is a template for a page definition. And let's give it a name of basic.ftl for free marker template language. And then let's just put in our credits.html. So as soon as I save that, and I go back to Magnolia, now I actually get something displayed and I don't get an error. It is not very exciting. It is almost not at all different than having a static resource like this, but there are a few key differences. So here's one. Instead of having to use our special directory, resources, and then the module name and so on, I just put in the page name that the author specified, and then this shows up. I can also, of course, put in the HTML suffix, and it still shows up. I can do even some interesting and weird tricks, like put a different file extension, and that'll kick off Magnolia's um, MIME type handler in the filter chain, and it'll send out the files in different formats with the appropriate MIME settings as needed, which can be handy at times or not, which is why you can disable it. Still, this doesn't actually do much for us, and there's a lot we can do. Let's look at what that looks like. If we set a name for the page, it stands to reason that that has to be available somewhere. Let's use our JCR browser to see what information we've got. So the JCR browser lets you look at the fragment of JCR that stores our web pages. And right now, all that's in there is one node called test.
let's set the title of the page and the heading to both be um, the name of the page. Inside of a FreeMarker template, Magnolia makes a set of values and different functions available. And the one thing we'll end up working with probably most often is the variable called content. It has a bunch of properties, and these properties correspond to values assigned to a page. Let's use our content.name variable and see what happens. Let's close that down. And it didn't show up. Let's look at our errors. Do, do, do. Failed at content name. Now, when we make mistakes like using um, variables that aren't set, we get actually fairly helpful tips in the error logs. So, for example, here we see that they recommend using the default value operator. So let's do that. And I'm not going to try to find what the error was that I made, though I'm happy to have the guys point it out to me. But say that I'm not sure a variable will be set, I can do this. All right. And then when I go back, the default value shows up instead. You can do this with literals, like the oops string, or you can do it with other values. And I'll extend this in just a minute. So we're still missing a few things, though, if we're used to working in Magnolia. If we go back and look at our test page, oh, <laughs> let me switch the pages app. OK, so we notice that this area where we have our page-related commands is not actually filled in with anything. So let's fix that. And this is where the last piece of a page template comes into place, the dialog definition. We use a dialog definition to configure a form to let an editor enter data in Magnolia. This has an interesting side effect of implicitly defining a data model for the page. You'll see what this means in a second. I'm going to go back to Vim. And I'm going to do two things. First, to let Magnolia know that this template is something we want to manage inside of the editor, we need to add a little bit of boilerplate text. We've already seen one uh, free marker uh, directive. These are called interpolations, this dollar sign curly brace expression curly brace. But we also have a tag-like structure. Uh, these are called directives. There are built-in directives that look like this, uh, square bracket, hash, and then something like search or whatever. There are also user-defined ones. And we use these to put in a few special things to let you work with templates. So in this case, and I forget the exact thing, so I'm going to look it up. Ah, yes, CMS page. This simple directive tells Magnolia that we want to manage it in Pages app. And then suddenly we get the basic controls we expect, the preview page, publish, and so on. However, our edit page properties is grayed out. When we define a dialog for a page template, this hooks into this page properties command. So let's do that right now. In the same way that templates have their own position in our light module hierarchy, uh, uh, dialogues do as well. So let's make that now. So quickly jump into the shell, make dir um, dialogues, and then pages, because we're working with a dialogue for a page template. And then let's edit that dialogue. So, um, and here, let me refresh my tree so you can see. All right, so dialogues, pages. It is another configuration file, so that means it's in YAML. And like everything else, we're going to use the same name for the file as we use for the template itself. Let me do that in the right window. OK. And let's just dump in our code, and I'll walk through it. All 
OK. So this is a little bit more complex configuration, but it's pretty simple. We begin with a form property. The form property uh, contains a tabs property. of plain text. This is a multi-line piece of text and so on. Okay, let's go back to Vim and look at that. So our label is what showed up at the top of the dialog. So let's call this page properties. And then we're going to have two things in there. We're going to have two fields more specifically. So we have a field that is named title. We have a field that is named description. We already have um, a title property for our pages app. It's not sorry for our page and the pages app. It's not set. Um, we can set it either here, if we go rename, or with our page properties dialog in a moment. We can set it when we're actually editing the page. So let's go back and do that. So we set a name for our field. We give it a class. In this case, it's a text field definition. When we're looking to see what fields we have available, we can go to the Magnolia docs, just punch in any existing name of a field, and you'll find yourself in the list. Hmm. Quality is down again, so here. Let's look at this generally, field definition. How's quality now? Um, if anyone could get out and, and push the internet until it moves faster, that would be great. So if we want to see all of the fields available to us, go to the docs and look up field definition. And then we can see a full list of all the different fields available and additional information on them. We are working on making shorter names for these so that they're easier to use. All right. So we have basically a title that is just plain text. We'll give it a label of title. The label is what shows up in the user interface. And then we're going to have a description field. We'll use a rich text field for this, which lets users apply styling. And then we'll give it the label of description. We've got two actions. These create buttons. One commits any changes we make after we open the dialog, and the other cancels. I'm going to write this out. I'm going to see if I induced any errors. So when I reloaded, it didn't reload. And there are two things that could have happened there. I could have some kind of syntax error, or three things. I could have forgotten to save. Or sometimes file observation on the Mac is a little slow. And let's see what happens here. Doo -doo -doo. Mm, this isn't a recent error. So let's open that up again. Okay, ah, all right. So I did make an error. Failed at content name, nope, 4828. Location, layered resource. Sometimes these still aren't as friendly as they could be. I'm going to go back in and just manually check over things. Dialogues, pages. Ah, of course. In the same way that we rely on the page um, definition to tell Magnolia that the definition is available, we also have to use our configuration to say there's a dialogue available. So let's set a property called dialogue, and then we give it a pseudo path. This path could actually be doing anything. It could be a class identifier, but when we're working in light uh, modules, it ends up being the module name. So webinar. We know it's a dialogue, so we skip that pages, and then we give it the name of the file without an extension, basic. All right. 
Now let's reload that and see what happens. There we go. Note that the observation of the file system took four or five seconds to catch up. That's something that's out of our control. It's dependent on uh, the Mac journaled file system. It's not usually any longer than 10 seconds. If it is, you've probably done something wrong. So here we can see um, what we've defined. And I'll go back so we can compare these things. So let's look at our page dialog definition. We have our form, which shows up right here. We have our tabs. Well, there's only one tab, so we don't see multiple. We have our label, page properties, page properties. And then we have our fields, title and description. Let's add a title. And then let's add our description. And let's save. OK. And then let's, let's load our page again. I can do that in the editor. I can do it here. And notice a few things. Nothing has changed. And that's because we haven't used any free marker to actually pull these variables out and get access to them. So let's do one or two things to try and make it so that this concept is fairly clear. Let's look at our JCR app to see what data is actually assigned or associated with the page test. So if we click or drop down, we can see that there are two properties, title and description. Let's access those properties. So let's change this to title. See what happens. And then the title that we set actually is the title that shows up. It is interesting to note that JCR makes it easy to do things that might not make a lot of sense, like this. You have multiple ways that you can edit the content that's managed in Magnolia. But mostly, editors will be working in the Pages app. On occasion, an admin might be working in the JCR, or another program might be working in the JCR to modify things. We can always look in our JCR browser to see what properties we have available to us in the content variable. So I'm going to jump back to my Pages app. You're probably noticing that this is all an editor can do. Ah, one other thing I'll hit along the way. Let's show our description. And let's use the same pattern that we've used before, content.description. We're going to see something helpful and perhaps a bit surprising that Magnolia does. So the content that we put into our rich text editor is, your, is um, entity encoded by default. And this is handy because it makes it hard to inject things. Um, but it is less handy when we want the rich text to display. So let's use one of the built-in functions that Magnolia provides to FreeMarker. We have about five groups of these functions. If you want to see them, you can go to the documentation. And let's dive in. Templates. Let's make that a little wider because of the font size. Template scripts. Templating functions. We can see we have these groups called CMSFN, SiteFN. FN, of course, stands for functions. And these are all functions meant to help you work with the website as a whole, with categories. Uh, CMSFN handles the content of your page as well, with search, with DAM, and so on. Let's use a function from CMF, CMSFN to decode the content. CMSFN, decode, open brace, or open bracket, close bracket. Decode all the content, and then access the description property, and close the docs, and reload. Now we have the rich text displayed as it should be. The other key thing that we're missing here is we're missing the ability to add, we don't have any area, and we need to be able to add components. So let's go and do that now. I'm just going to advance my notes so I don't miss the key points. All right. For areas, um, to an editor, they're simply a place on a page where they can add content, uh, and content specifically being a component, something like actually the page properties. This could really just as easily be a component as it is the thing that's hooked to the page properties command. 
For us, though, they um, do two things. They give us a way to take groups of components and apply styling to them, and they give us control over what components editors have access to. So let's quickly drop in the necessary boilerplate to make our areas available. And this is another directive uh, that we've defined, CMS area. And I think it's just name equals main. Um, just in case I'm going to check that. Yes. All right. This little piece of code drops an area in. But because we haven't updated our configuration yet, Magnolia doesn't really respond to it. So let's go into our page template configuration and let's add in an area. And I'm going to use a piece of boilerplate. So um, you can have one or more areas inside of a page template. Here we've defined uh, an area called main. We're going to render it with free marker. And we're going to have a list of possible components. You can have one or more, possibly even zero or more, but I haven't tried that. The name is just a simple string. I'm going to call this one image. And I'm going to give it an ID. And the ID is the same sort of form that we saw in our dialog up here. Our module name, oops, which is webinar. It's going to live in the components part of the uh, directory tree, and we're going to give it a name of just image. Let's save that. Let's reload and see what happens. And let's do that again. Did I save? There we go. So Suddenly now we have the editing component that lets us, lets us drop uh, components into an area, but we have no components defined. So let's make some. And don't worry, I'll speed up. We will hit the end of this in about 10 minutes. So let's do two things. Let's go back to our page template, and let's show what I mean by let us control styling. So we can drop this into any arbitrary HTML that we want. And we could have multiple areas, so we can position them in all kinds of places. They will let people drop components in in a WYSIWYG-ish fashion as they wish. So now let's go and try and make some of the components we defined. A component template is almost the same as a page template. Everything that we've learned up to this point about pages, we can pretty much use in components. So what do we know? We know that they'll need to have a separate path. So make dir. Templates, Components. And we know that they'll have a dialog. So let's do that as well. OK. So we've got our two directories there. Let's refresh our tree. OK. And let's start again with the definition. So edit, templates, components, image.yaml. Sorry, let me do this in the right window. OK. And then we can just copy in what we have in our uh, uh, page template um, configuration. So templates, pages. OK. Title, select image from DAM. We're going to make a component that lets us select images from the digital asset manager that's built into Magnolia. We're going to have a free marker template script to render it. And we're going to put that in the path that we know we need now, components. And we're going to call it image. We're going to render it with free marker. It's going to be visible. It's going to need a dialog, but areas don't have areas. So the dialog is going to be in our webinar module. It is not a page. It is a component. OK. 
oops, image, singular. Dam. And there's a little bit of funky stuff that happens in here. We have um, a special class that converts the IDs of one particular app type into something that's more usable for us. I can't cover it here. Frankly, I hardly understand it myself, but I can copy and paste code from the docs. We'll cover these advanced topics hopefully in later blog posts. All right. It still has the same actions of commit, cancel, and save. Sorry, um, save and cancel. Let's save it. And let's see if I made any errors. Our component is available. Let's select it. Now we can choose an image from the DAM. Let's select a new one. Let's decrease the screen size for a moment. Let's upload a file. All right. And then let's choose it. And let's crease this back. Save our changes. And then suddenly it complains, as it should, because we haven't made our template to render it yet. So let's do two quick things, and then we're done the actual demo, and not so late. So let's quickly look at our JCR browser to see what got created in our data model. So we added our component, and then suddenly we have this new property called main. And inside main, we have this mysterious sub-property called zero. Each component that we add to an area gets its own automatically generated ID. This is important for namespacing. If you think about how FreeMarker is using things, we call things like, say, content.title. But if you're inside of a, a component and you have multiple components that you can add multiple times to a page, how do you end up differentiating between them? So this is how Magnolia does it. It effectively namespaces them, each transparently on its own. If we look at what's been added, though, it says we have a property called image. And this is a bit strange. It's a value. It's just JCR and then some long string. This is an identifier for an asset in JCR. We can display it. Let's go and make our component do that. So let's create our template file. So templates, components, image, FTL. And let's do the naive approach first. We don't need any boilerplate HTML for this because it's going inside of HTML. Let's just add, a little, add in a little bit of free marker. Content, image. Let's display it. And let's see what we get. We get the string. So how do we turn this string into something useful? And here we go back to our documentation and we look for get asset link. I'm cheating because I know it's in the dam fn functions. All the functions for getting stuff out of the dam live here. And if I go down, I find that I'm just going to search. If I find there's a method called get asset link, and all I have to do is give it an item key, and it gives me back a uh, a uh, complete path to the asset. So let's do that. I'm going to save myself time. All right. I'm going to use a few extra pieces of free marker here. I'm going to use an if statement. So this is using the free marker um, 
uh, directive, so if directive, if content with property image actually has content. And this means that it's not empty and it's not null. If this is true, then let's call our um, damfn get asset link method. Let's call it on our ID that we got for the content image. And let's assign it to a variable called link. Let's use a little bit of HTML and assign the, um, or insert the link in an image tag. Let's save it and reload. There we have this very handsome bulldog. So in a nutshell, this is the basic process of light development. There are a lot of tools to help you advance here. They're not as advanced as they could be. I know that I had to dig a bit to find some things, but there's more good stuff coming. And I'm happy if you ping me. I'm also very, very happy if you write on the forums. Um, these questions are much easier to answer typically than say, well, heavyweight development questions about Magnolia. I'll send you a handout that has information on what I found as I've worked through. And it's got some extra things like a handout that we made for the conference to help people in one of our workshops. Um, you will have the recording. And when I get back from a vacation in three beautiful weeks, I will be blogging about solutions to common light development tasks and issues. And I'm hoping that some of the other folks here will start doing the same. There are also other tools available inside of Magnolia to help you out here. And I'm going to show you one more, and then I'm going to hand things over to questions. So the JCR browser, super handy. But here's another interesting tool. Um, well, Groovy, the Groovy shell is also handy for letting you explore the data model that's available. But let's go into Web Dev and let's look at the Resources app. The Resources app shows us the parsed state of well, many things, but for our light modules, it shows us what Magnolia recognizes for what we've created. It gives us a nice browsable way to see what's in there. And the coolest thing is that, well, say that I make an error and I ship it in production. And let's go make that error right now. Um, I want to comment out a little bit of code. Say I don't want to title anymore. But I forget to close my comment tag and I save it. Um, later that night, an administrator goes and looks at the site and sees that all of our templates based on the pages template are blank. He doesn't have access to upload the files, and he's not even necessarily sure that he wants to mess around in the light directory. But he's an experienced sysadmin. He can simply go into the resources app. Let's look at our page template here. Look at it and go, oh, that doesn't look right. That's a comment. He clicks this little button, hotfix resource. It creates a copy of the page, of the template. He deletes the comment, and he saves it. So we can see that currently Magnolia in the system is overriding what's going on in the file system. Let's go back and look at my template, and let's reload it. No changes here. It hasn't done anything to the actual files. But until we actually click the Remove Hotfix button, what Magnolia will serve is simply what is shown here. It's a handy way to deal with small troubling issues very, very quickly while you work up a better patch. There are additional tools like this. I'll write about them in the coming weeks, and I'll include some of them in the handout that I'm going to send out. I hope that this has given you an interesting uh, practical overview of what light development looks like in Magnolia. It's not exhaustive, but that's what the documentation is for. And we hope to cover the topic again in more specifics in coming webinars. Depending on what things you're interested in learning about, we could focus, say, on dealing with categorization, um, dealing with the dam, what have you. Make your requests, and we'll do our best to accommodate them. Now, thankfully, that is the uh, last bit of talking that I'll probably have to do and the last bit of coding that I'll have to do. Let's, let's start talking about your questions, and let's discuss.
All right, so we've got a bunch of questions uh, coming in the questions panel. Uh, we've answered uh, a few of them already, uh, yet I will reiterate them because then they will also um, be in the recording. So um, I'll start with uh, the first question that we had. Uh, it was um, it was actually more um, 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 well, about the typical scenario where you would use um, um, this new uh, Magnet Resources directory in a, in a deployment scenario, uh, and can you use actually this directory? Uh, can you use a shared directory between the author and the public instance, um, or, use it, or do you have to use a separate one? And uh, actually, yeah. So I, I, I basically replied, there's no one fits for all approach. Uh, if you're, especially if you're, if you have a local dev instance, it might well be valid and rather agile to use a shared directory, uh, so that uh, your changes will be um, validated at the same time um, for the uh, author uh, instance and the public instance. Um, one alternative to synchronize this is actually also to go the Git way, and that might actually. Uh, be a, uh, a real-life scenario, especially if you have many public instances. You could um, control, say, um, well, pull the changes on a, on a test or integration environment and pull them later on the actual public. Uh, so, because it's file-based, uh, you can imagine any any kind of, uh, of scenario. Uh, another question that we had uh, was more about uh, troubleshooting uh, changes not being picked up. Uh, when making changes in, uh, in YAML files uh, within Eclipse, for example. Um, mind that if you are actually uh, uh, editing YAML definitions served from a Maven module, you have to set the uh, .develop property to true. This also triggers the class path observation because it's a bit of a costly operation. Uh, this should clearly be documented in the Magnolia Properties file, and uh, I will actually do so um, very shortly. Um, but yeah, that's basically um, one thing to be aware of. Um, um, what else do we have? Um, Let's see a question about uh, JCR-based config. Um, it was it was, used to be possible to add components to existing configuration in JCR from a different from different modules, uh, or yeah, do this either with Bootstrap files or through um, version handlers. Well. Um, configuration by file is, at, at the moment at least, it's mostly about lighter development, so indeed you cannot do uh, all those advanced uh, things that you used to do with the full-fledged uh, Maven modules and with version handlers and module descriptors. So, um, yeah, configuration file cannot decorate uh, existing configuration or add a, an ID to, uh, to, to a list of available components. You would still need a bootstrap file for that, and that means you need a, a proper Magnolia module for this to, to be picked up. Um, we are, um, on the other hand, working in uh, lowering the entry barrier there as well. Um, in particular, yeah, you should be able to um, amend configuration more easily also with those files. That means not just provide your own, but also yeah, edit or decorate existing configuration uh, with files. But this is in a very early stages and will be uh, in the, uh, it's, an, it's an essential piece for us as well as a software editor because we'll enable to um, use also this configuration and be Yes, uh, 
uh, chat, I'm not, is, it, is it coming back now? All right, uh, okay, so thanks for staying, <laughs> not leaving uh, yet. Uh, yeah, so I was basically mentioning, um, yeah, we, we'll be working on decoration for configuration that should make your life easier as well, uh, especially to register uh, either new apps in the app launcher or uh, new templates in existing areas, in existing configuration provided by others. Um, I'll briefly go through other questions. Um, one question was about, can we define content apps in YAML? Yes, we can totally do so. There was also a question regarding that on the forums lately. Uh, one thing that helps getting started there is um, in Magnolia 541, we introduced a download as YAML action in the configuration app. So you can actually, um, well, it's not granted that it, um, that it works in all cases, but at least I could uh, successfully export the contacts app as a as a YAML file, and uh, and use this file uh, to create an just another content app that was working like a charm. Um, what else? Wait, Mika, I'm very excited by this, and apparently behind on development. Um, does it round trip well? So if we export an app as YAML and then we continue editing it. Um, do the edits get propagated after each edit the same way other things in light development do? The only thing this uh, download action does is uh, converting the node structure into the YAML format. There are some formatting works that I mentioned back in my conference talk. Um, and one of them is actually knowing when you have to use the dash notation versus the map notation in YAML. And so, well, this can uh, help you get started if you come if you start from an existing app configured in JCR or a dialog or template definition configured in JCR, then uh, you can uh, very easily get the, the default conver con converted version of YAML. Then how you provide it is a different story. Uh, of course, you should make sure you have no conflict between your existing JCR definition. If you, if you want to start using the file one, then you should delete the, the JCR one, for example. Um, and then, yeah, it's just the same way as for, um, for the typical light development. Let's see if I have another question. Feel free to enter more questions if uh, if you get inspired. Um, there was one question. There's w there was one question about the configuration overview. Uh, it's a bit off topic. Um, well, it's like, because it's not something we actually bundle at the moment. Uh, but those aware of the of the new configuration mechanism or those who have seen uh, uh, webinars or conference presentations, uh, then you know we're also working on providing a new configuration overview app. Um, and well, this uh, enables basically to see all the definitions that are registered in the system, all the template definitions, all the dialogue definitions, all the app descriptors, and what have you. Um, and uh, there was question whether we would also have editing in there. Um, well, at first, it's mostly um, an overview tool to see what is the live configuration, but of course, it should also um, provide at least helpers towards the editing capabilities. So at least you should be able to jump to the source where the configuration is loaded from, whether it's in the JSR configuration tree or whether it's coming from a resource file that you should be able to browse in the resources app. Uh, and in the future, we'll try to uh, integrate this even more, so you can maybe do in-app editing with autocomplete and so on. That's pretty much what I have. Um, okay, it seems we have more questions coming, so maybe we can wait for uh, a couple of minutes more. I know the participants are at a disadvantage because we can talk and they have to type. We are looking at an alternate uh, solution for managing questions in webinars. We recognize that GoToWebinar has a pretty Stone Age QA interface. Um, suggestions are welcome, but um, hopefully we'll roll something out um, after the next couple of webinars because these 
these don't really provide a very good collaborative environment. So we'll keep waiting while you keep typing. Okay, there we go. So uh, it was mentioned in an unconference session. Unfortunately, I didn't seem to attend this one. It was discussed uh, to provide an easy way of sharing components or to use the component definition, to use in the component definition a way of providing the area it should register with. Um, okay, so yeah, so, so we've seen I'm not basically uh, really up to date on that topic, and I don't think there's uh, there are hot developments at the moment on on that. Um, but yeah, basically what we did in Magnolia 5.4 versus what it used to be before is, was mostly about uh, providing this configuration. Was not necessarily about changing the model of the configuration itself. But um, as we see the files, they bring like new possibilities as well, and yeah, we will be looking forward also to um, to seeing how we can uh, simplify the configuration models, maybe some definitions, um, maybe provide a more condensed um, a condensed definition all in one place. Let's say also one fancy ID was to bring the dialog definition itself with the plate definition that is just other um, areas that we will explore into simplifying configuration. Uh, and yeah, simplifying it is actually the, the key word because yeah, it's very verbose at the moment, no matter it, whether it is from JCR or um, or in a file, it is still pretty verbose, so we have to simplify it, provide uh, good defaults, um, and yeah, we are, we're exploring these areas, yes. And with that, I think we are, go we are through. Okay, well, thank you all very much for attending. We hope this has been interesting, and we hope that you have a good number of questions for us afterwards and that you try late development. I'd like to thank uh, Mika and Christoph uh, for, uh, for participating today and answering questions and helping out, sharing their expertise. I'd like to thank my computer for not crashing during the demo. Um, and that's it. I hope you all have a great day wherever you are. Take care.